So this afternoon's talk topic is equanimity. And as with all the other Dharma talks that we've had this week, there's no need to become overly elaborative in the conceptual mind and simply just sit back and watch your experience. Allow the various associations with the words that you hear to rise and pass of their own accord. And you may join in just simple noting. In this moment, there is breathing. There is pressure. There is seeing. There's coolness. There's thinking. And some of these thoughts drift towards some of the science surrounding meditation. So one study I find very interesting on long-term meditators uh, and pain tolerance. It's a good area of study. I think when most people um, consider what sort of uh, pain tolerance long-term meditators would have, they would normally think, oh, well, actually, you know, someone with a lot of meditation might have less pain overall. Um, so part of how this gets studied is they'll take uh, people with no meditation practice and people with long-term meditative practice and they'll place them in a lab and have what's called a cold plate test, which is putting your hand on a plate that can suddenly become very, very cold. It's quite painful when it does. And so normally for, for most of us, when we have that pain, what happens is the areas of the brain associated with pain increase and they have a long slow tail right as the pain slowly resolves one of the curious things with meditators is actually the pain centers increase but they increase two three times as high right and then they almost immediately come back to baseline so that as meditators are sitting there their experience is ow pain there's breathing there's seeing there's hearing. Curious thing about this as well is that if you tell the person, all right, well, we're going to turn that cold plate back on in one minute, most of us will almost immediately start to have pain as we start to anticipate, oh, man, it's going to hurt so bad. I really hope they don't turn that plate on. I hope this time it's better. I really don't, I don't want that to happen. Right? Whereas the more that you do this practice, it becomes there is seeing, there is hearing, there is anticipation, holy cow, that hurts, there is breathing, there is relaxing. So one way to say this is that our practice hurts more and bothers less. There is seeing. There is planning. There is coolness. Years ago, I used to use a particular metaphor um, in psychotherapy. And then I had a strange experience. So instead, I tell the story. And that was uh, I was visiting some friends uh, north of Seattle and was walking back to an Airbnb in order to take a nap. I was walking along the shoreline of a river leading up to the ocean. And in one moment, I thought, oh, my foot is wet. And in the next moment, I was hip deep in quicksand. So I'd never, I'd never been in quicksand. I thought it was something maybe from Tarzan movies. Um, and it's really jarring suddenly finding yourself consumed in quicksand. It feels incredibly threatening. It feels, it's really unpleasant. It's cold. And you sort of figure out while you're in there, there's nothing to step on. Now, the problem with quicksand is that um, basically there's a void beneath your feet. And if you go through your usual attempt to try to control experience, what you end up doing is actually deepening 
the void because you're stepping into nothing. And that's where it actually becomes dangerous. The way out of quicksand, paradoxically, is actually to give it permission to consume you. And so what that looks like is actually leaning back into the quicksand in order to have it make as much contact as possible. And so with that, the weight of your body actually transitions to a wider surface area. And so you find yourself on top of the quicksand and very, very, very slowly you can kind of circle your way out until you actually find firmer ground. And equanimity is a bit like this process, right? That we all find ourselves at some points in it, consumed in something we didn't want, right? Struggling to try to step into essentially what's the void. And the way out of that is actually to lay back and let it consume you. Right? Give it permission to be there. What this requires is a certain type of trust in the path and one's capacity to have that experience exactly as it is. Or to quote Rumi, give up to grace. The ocean takes care of each wave until it reaches the shore. And so this moment is exactly like this. Breathing is like this. Noting is like this. Taste is like this. Now, part of the problem is that we come to believe that some part of whatever the current experience is should not be there. One of the reasons for this is that our minds are evolved for survival, not for happiness. It is one of the greatest evolutionary heritage that we all have to essentially have an organ that is able to anticipate the future and is able to think about ourselves in relationship to the rest of our tribe. The problem with having this survival organ is that as we sit back and attempt to surrender, attempt to relax into the current moment exactly as it is, inevitably this mind scans for what's wrong. Where is the threat? Rewards, they'll be there tomorrow, but it's the threats that our minds have to pay attention to. And of course, this is shaped by experience. So for those of us with trauma history, unfortunately, trauma is one of those experiences in which the mind learns, mm, best to be extra careful, must scan all the much more. If you grew up in a family system in which safety was not always guaranteed, that becomes an important part of one's learning history. It becomes all the much harder to rest in the current moment, exactly as it is. And of course, in our current context, with the collapse that is slowly occurring across government, financial, cultural systems, the huge mess that we all find ourselves in, it can be very, very difficult to actually lay back and have a sense of trust in this path. And of course, there are some members of our society who have had a much harder learning history, that the accumulated traumas over generations is a harder barrier. So this talk is occurring on Juneteenth, which is a hopefully emerging national holiday, which celebrates the last day that slaves were held under slavery in Texas at the end of the Civil War. And so I just want to take a moment in this talk to acknowledge the stain of slavery in our collective history, and also to celebrate the ongoing liberation of African Americans' bodies and minds. One of my favorite modern bodhisattvas is Martin Luther King. And if you've not taken a chance to ever read his Ten Commandments for the Birmingham protest, I would encourage you to look that up at some point. Two of them 
uh, that are my favorite are walk and talk in the manner of love, for God is love, and pray daily to be used by God in order that all men might be free. There is breathing. There is seeing. There is thirst. There is settling. In Buddhism, there are what is known as the near and far enemies of particular beneficial states. And so the far enemy of equanimity is paranoia. And it's the sense that reality is somehow ganged up on you. Every thought, every sensation somehow has it out for you. The near enemy is indifference. Uh, when confronted with the suffering of another, or even the su suffering of ourselves, we might just say, eh, sucks to be you. Looks like that hurts. So equanimity should not be mistaken for indifference. There is no ability to actually avoid the slings and arrows of our lives. Instead, in this moment, we might cultivate a sense of anti-fragility, remaining open to this moment exactly as it is. In this moment, there might be heartache. Desire for relief is like this. Desire for protection is like this. Letting go is like this. Opening up is like this. It is fair to say that a Buddha is a profoundly vulnerable person. Wide open to this moment. Hurting more, bothered less. Pausing is like this. Seeing is like this. <coughs> One of my favorite Sufi stories tells of a smuggler who would go to the border with his caravan of donkeys. And at some point, a border guard became more and more convinced that the smuggler was doing something illegal. And so he would go through all the various uh, loads that the donkeys were carrying and search through the hay and search through the sticks. He could never find it. And this went on for years and years and years. After about 10 years, as the border guard was beginning to orient towards the end of his career, he finally asked the smuggler, I'm, I'm utterly convinced you are smuggling something. What? What are you smuggling? And the man said, donkeys. There's a quality of experience that when we think that something shouldn't be there, inevitably we're looking for something that isn't actually there. And instead, freedom can be found right in front of you. It's a bit like looking for your glasses to only find that you are currently wearing them. Familiarity is like this. Comfort is like this. In some ways, the bothers less part of the equation comes from how the context of our experience changes. And that discomfort or pain or desire may arise 
However, when it is put into the orderly flow of all other experiences, it becomes in a space that's much wider. In fact, that's unbounded. So it's a bit like contrasting being in a closet with a mosquito versus being in a stadium with a mosquito. Out of this wide expanse of mind, this particular thought arises and disappears. Out of silence, this particular sound arises and disappears. And from a place of stillness, this body arises, moves, disappears, arises, moves, disappears. The other day, Francis used the metaphor of the breakthrough phase as being like fireworks with a type of euphoria. I'm not quite sure what my wife exactly meant when she said, relationships are like meditation. At first you're promised fireworks, and then you settle for quiet contentment. And then you realize that quiet contentment is the greater joy. Another way of describing the breakthrough phrase is like a gurgling waterfall. It's very flashy. Water goes everywhere. It's a spectacle. It's exciting. Over time, what starts to happen is the rock begins to become more and more carved. And in the deep flow of time, equanimity is more like a river, appearing almost unmoving in its quality, a certain stillness to it, yet having tremendous flow, a steady force of equanimous presence. The unobscured mind is an extremely powerful instrument. Now, from that place of equanimity, we are not indifferent to the suffering of ourselves or others. We are wide open and available to it. This is to say that we are always responding. Whether the stimulus is gratitude, joy, seeing, hearing, the very next moment is a response. In action is like this. Jumping into action is like this. Self-protection is like this. Skillful responding is like this. Viktor Frankl says, between the stimulus and the response, there is a space. In that space lies our freedom and power to choose our response. In our response lies growth and freedom. Thank you.